Time for Yahoo You. Ryan Chung is here with this week's lesson. All right, well, class is in session. With all the buzz about IPOs this week, it's worth highlighting a recent trend in public offerings, dual class or super voting shares. But let's kick it off and explain this by resurrecting our hypothetical company. You recall it is Chung Shoes. I manufacture shoes, and guess what? We are going public. And when a company goes public, they have to file this right here. This is the S1. This is a cover sheet that many financial reporters are probably getting PTSD from. This is the big document that's submitted with the Securities and Exchange Commission that details consolidated financial statements, and market research that explains the company's business model. Now, while investors pour into the numbers, they also pay close attention to corporate governance, how the company is structured, and who has power over it. And power has to do with voting shares. So in the case of Chung Shoes, you might think that the conventional notion is that I might issue common stock, where each share is equal to one vote, right? One share of Chung Shoes gives you one vote in a number of different matters, like who's on the board of directors, issuance of new securities, and even some sort of management uh, decisions in some cases. Now, for a one-for-one -one issuance, this is pretty simple. If you want more power, well, you should just buy more shares. Now, what we've seen in the actual uh, market is that you know CEOs that have richer equity compensation don't necessarily have more voting power. Almost three-fourths of S&P 500 CEOs, and this is coming from ISS Analytics, uh, actually have less than 0.5% voting power. That's represented by the purple part of this bar chart or cir circle chart. Only 12% of S&P 500 CEOs, as a result, have more than 1% voting power. But lately, companies have started getting a little bit more creative, including myself. Now, again, Chung Shoes, so let's say for me, as the chairman, president, CEO, and I'll also call myself supreme ruler at it, over Chung Shoes, I think I have more vision over where my company should go. I mean, after all, I built it. Now, I don't want to deal with all those other shareholders getting in the way, so I can implement this right here. This is a dual class voting share that I've incorporated into my S1. So. Class A shareholders on the left will get one vote per share. Pretty simple, just like before. But the executives and I get these coveted Class B shares that have, get this, 20 votes per share. Now, Wall Street refers to these as super voting shares because that means that as an executive, Superman over here, I get a lot more say over who's on my board of directors, you know, big, big decisions around company decisions, things of that sort. Now, this is becoming a prevailing trend for Silicon Valley firms that are taking over Wall Street after Google first made it cool in 2004 with their own dual class structure. And this has been a component of Lyft, Peloton, and Snap shares as well. Now, research from a professor at the University of Florida has shown that a higher percentage of tech companies over the last five years have opted for the structure when going public. You can see that represented by the purple part of this bar chart, this, or rather this line chart. This chart actually divides IPOs since 1980 into two buckets, tech and also non-tech. Now, while non-tech companies, that's represented by the blue line, have seen ups and downs in dual class structures, more and more tech companies going public have clearly opted for more power to the executives. In 2017, we actually saw a peak where about one in five tech companies going public incorporated this type of dual class structure. Now, it's important to note that there's actually nothing illegal about this. The idea is that if investors want to invest in it, they know from the S1 exactly what the structure looks like. So it's up to you to decide if this is a good idea or not. So as we continue to get through these big IPOs, got to pay attention to not just the financials, but also the dual class structure of these shares. Well, and in many cases, the investors themselves are voting by not buying these shares. At least that's what that's one of the criticisms, of course, of WeWork was that it had kind of hinky governance, right? Including this, I think it has more classes of shares than just two, right? In some cases, that can yeah. be the case, yeah. You know, uh, and so this has been sort of deferring to yeah. this. And what we saw was with WeWork, right? I mean, there was all that kind of uh, uh, in inflammation around the structure that Adam Newman and the amount of power that he had as a CEO before he was ousted. Keep in mind that the original S1 originally suggested giving 20 votes per share, as was the case with Chung Shoes, to Class B voting uh, shareholders. But they actually ended up dialing that back to 10. Now, those are still, by all standards, more powerful votes than the Class A shares. But S S1s can change before they go public. And I think with WeWork, we saw that ultimately it's, that wasn't it's enough. It's interesting you, you raised this, or we're talking about this in a week where we saw so many different headlines coming out of WeWork. Masayoshi Son, of course, with SoftBank, one of the biggest investors in WeWork, uh, made some comments recently saying public investors aren't going to tolerate gimmicks like super voting rights or complicated share structures. <laughs> The privileged founders over other stakeholders, and he also said they should get in shape years before they consider going public. That's an interesting comment coming from the guy who basically pushed the valuation for WeWork the concept, up to $45 billion. The dollars. concept of these kinds of different uh, powers and, uh, within shares is not new. I mean, Ford. 
Ford Motor Company. Right. The Ford family has had the controlling shares for yeah. decades. And, and a lot of that trend actually stuck originally, if you're re rewinding to the days of Ford, uh, with families. They wanted to keep the power inside the families because people would invest in those companies, not just because of the business model, but because they believed in the family trust that was assumedly going to have this company for a long time. Akiko, you bring up an interesting point about uh, you know, the, the role of the many parties that are involved in piecing together the S1. That's kind of what I wanted to start off that Yahoo You segment by saying it really all starts off with this one SEC document because it's not just the company that's involved with that. It's the underwriters and then also their legal staff, obviously the management at the company itself. Now, we have to consider that when you have a bank that's trying to make money off of getting an S1 public. You have lawyers that are trying to get fees because they're trying to advise on what the best way to structure this whole thing is going to look like. I mean, there's a lot of kind of incentive structure differences that might, you know, in, entail these, these, this, this power struggle over who's going to have control over the company. So as we get to these big unicorn IPOs, right, I mean, we're seeing companies of unprecedented size before go public. This is a bigger power struggle because it's a bigger struggle over a bigger company. And I think when we see Adam Newman, we saw the scrutiny over Travis Kalanick at Uber. Uh, Uber actually had originally supported uh, dual class structure. They actually en ended up removing that structure. So they now have just kind of straight one vote, one vote shares. Um, but you know, this is something that we're gonna need to think about as we continue to get through some of these more IPOs, Airbnb, the next big one. Um, we'll see what happens next. We'll go with the direct listing now, right? Exactly. You look a lot better in the tights and the cape than Adam <laughs> Newman. You see that the, the candid shot of him walking down the street bare Without any shoes Manhattan? on, yeah. That was that was a, that was a bad look, mm. yeah. Ryan, thank you. <laughs> hey, investors, Zach Guzman here. Are you interested in learning more about the markets and getting the latest financial news? Well, then click right here to subscribe to our Yahoo Finance YouTube channel. Get the latest up-to-the-minute market analysis, big interviews in the world of finance, and information on how to manage your money every day, wherever you are.